So again, my disclosure. So, you know, uh, treating cutaneous lymphomas, we've heard uh, all evening the heterogeneous disease, the varied presentations. We've had a lot of conversation about how not curable this disease is. Most patients have an indolent disease. Lesions wax and wane. There's no uniform treatment paradigm, even though we have treatment guidelines. But even within those guidelines, treatments are listed alphabetically most of the time. Um, we know that CTCL is not one disease, it's genetic and heter uh, heterogeneity, and prognostic markers are lacking. So these are sort of some of the challenges of trying to treat this disease. Um, I want to start with a little bit with the quality of life supportive care issues that have been brought up earlier in the talks as well. One is pruritus and the second is infection. So pruritus is a very difficult symptom to treat. And for, the most, for most patients who have pruritus, that is really the biggest problem. But we don't really understand the biology of uh, pruritus, or fully understand the biology of pruritus in these patients. We think it's a multifaceted pathway. And we usually recommend supportive care, moisturizers, emollients, steroids. There's a list of anti-pruritic uh, agents. None of them that works very well. Um, but, you know, it's, it's worth trying, uh, especially, I mean, I find a lot of success with gabapentin uh, and some of these um, uh, sort of SSRIs. The other issue is infection, and this uh, points out to, I mean, one of the main causes of morbidity and even mortality in patients with CTCL is infection. Um, you know, the skin disease, the skin barrier is broken. Immune, and it's an immunosuppressed state, we know that, um, and all of this leads to infection. We just heard of a case of a patient who got romadepsin and that died of COVID-19 pneumonia. Um, so we have to be very careful in selecting pa uh, agents and treating these patients with, and to minimize risks of infection. That includes things like even ECP. You know, I constantly get asked to put in catheters in these patients because venous access is poor, and with the risk of infection, it's a no-no at our institution, no catheters. Um, so one of the things you can do is you can actually culture their skin and see if they're colonized with, um, you know, staph uh, and treat that and can sometimes help their itching and even sometimes reduce the severity of their illness. That has been shown by Madeleine Dubik that some of the flares of this disease are associated with infection. Bleach baths, things like that are helpful in avoiding central lines. So this is um, a disease which, as you know, in this room, we have uh, dermat dermatologists, hematologists, dermatopathologists, sometimes radiation oncologists as well. So it is a disease that's best treated in a multidisciplinary care team. And I was so happy to see this morning that uh, in Kuwait, there is a great center where this principle is being applied. So not just the physicians. I think part of the team needs to be uh, psychologists, social workers, wound care nurses. This is a chronic disease that patients suffer. We tell them it's a non-curable disease, and so that psychologic sort of, uh, you know, especially in young patients, uh, they need a lot of support. So, um, you know, and so we have to then think of all these things when we are planning a treatment uh, a paradigm. Um, so this is a, a slide uh, that was, I was asked to put in um, for, uh, you know, le legal purposes. So when, I, when we talk about personalized treatment approaches in oncology in general, I think the field is moving towards what we call targeted approaches. So that's why I put this slide in, just to kind of show you how people are starting to think about you know, real personalized medicine in oncology in general and in, in T-cell lymphomas in particular. So if you break down some of the signaling pathways and try to, try to direct treatments towards those signaling pathways, you can sort of look at a few things. You can look at TCR receptor signaling pathways, and this is where, um, you know, we know some of the genes that are, uh, that are dysfunctional in these pathways, and you could target them with treatments like PI3 kinase inhibitors, for example. It's a big hit in T-cell lymphomas, uh, systemic uh, lymphomas. Um, some of the calcineurin inhibitors uh, work that way. You have membrane receptors like CD30 or CCR4 that can be targeted with specific um, antibody or antibody-directed treatments. Um, cytokine regulators, JAK-STAT uh, pathway um, can be dysregulated in many types of T-cell lymphomas, including CTCL, and perhaps could be targeted with a JAK inhibitor. Chromatin remodeling, HDAC inhibitors, obviously work through that pathway, and also methylation, both histone methylation and other uh, methylation um, agents uh, are now being looked at in different types of T-cell lymphomas, particularly EZH2 inhibitors um, and uh, hypomethylating agents. 
similarly, cell cycle inhibitors. I have a clinical trial right now with CDK9 inhibitors in, in cutaneous lymphomas. So that's another pathway that we can be looking down, at that, down the line. Uh, we've had some luck with messenger RNA inhibition using a MIR-155 antibody. MIR-155 is overexpressed in CTCL. Uh, BH3 mimetic antagonists. I had a trial with venetoclax in CTCL. Didn't go anywhere, didn't do very well, but there are other BCL2 inhibitors that are possibly being developed in cutaneous lymphomas. But this is all coming. What do we have now? So I'm not going to go into details about this. We've heard a lot about skin-directed therapies for early-stage disease. This is just a list of the different agents we have, obviously topical steroids and nitrogen mustard uh, gels, light therapy. Um, these are skin-directed. They have reasonable response rates, and, and Julia just pointed out about the time to next treatment. Um, and I think when we are choosing these therapies, we should really think about all the criteria that I mentioned, that we need these patients to be on long-term treatments and avoid complications as much as possible. The good news about skin-directed therapies is that it can be combined with systemic therapy. And really, as hemat uh, hematologists, I should always, I always point out to my hematology colleagues that please don't forget our dermatology colleagues. They can help us manage these patients. And even if they're getting systemic therapy, sometimes use of topical gels can help um, you know, some of those pa early pa you know, patch disease or disease that's not responding as well to chemotherapy. Um, so how do you choose systemic therapy? Because that's really my area uh, of expertise. So you have to really, we've learned a lot about the compartmentalization of this disease. Skin, lymph node, blood, viscera. So it's important to know what parts, uh, what, what areas are involved. Because as I'll show you, there are different agents that work better in different compartments. And that's kind of where the field is now headed. We have to uh, figure out if the patient has transformed disease or not, and whether that transformation is in the skin or lymph nodes, or if there are multiple sites of transformation. Obviously, the side effect profile is very important um, because, again, long-term treatment is needed. We don't want to burden them with side effects that are going to be intolerable. Comorbidities, so somebody is a diabetic, has already has polyneuropathy, you don't really want to give them brintuximavidotin or at least modify the dose because you don't want to make that uh, worse. Lifestyle considerations, ECP, for example, if they have to travel 100 miles to get their ECP, maybe that's not the best option for them. Think about stem cell transplant. You have to start planning that early. So if you have a patient who's progressing with, again, we don't have a crystal ball for these, but if a patient's progressing rapidly in the first one to two years of their disease or presents with advanced disease, please start thinking about transplant, refer them to your transplant team, try to find a donor in the back, you know, keep them uh, find out that there's a donor available and sort of keep them in the reserve and look for clinical trials if available. Okay, so here is uh, a table of our commonly used agents in systemic, um, in, uh, in cutaneous lymphomas. And I'm not going to read through all of these, but what I wanted to point out was that we are starting to look at the different responses of these agents, not just overall response rate, but which compartment it works better in. And this is actually from an ASH education booklet a couple of years ago. Um, so you can see, for example, some of the older agents, we don't have a lot of data with its compartment based. But if you look at, um, for example, brentuximab vedotin, um, you can see that there's slightly different response rates in different compartments. Uh, similarly for um, you know, some of these newer agents like an anti cure antibody, you have a higher response rate in, in blood compartment versus other diseases. So maybe uh, you could think about some of these, um, you know, before choosing one of these agents, you can think about which compartment you really need to target. Um, a lot, you know, sometimes we don't have the data, but if you do, then it, it's helpful. Um, some of the interesting novel agents that we have access to in the States but, and possibly will, uh, they will get approved. One of them is this E777, which is the CD25-directed immunotoxin. This is the old ONTAC. It has been re, uh, as you remember, it was approved for the treatment of CTCL back in the day, 2009, I believe. And then it was taken off the market and now it's been re reformulated and it's supposed to be more potent with less side effects. And we just finished the, the pivotal trial with a response rate of about 36.2%. Oh, and it's, it wasn't studied in different compartments only because the FDA required us to imitate the same trial that was used in ONTAC years ago. Um, so this probably is going to get approved as the next line in the US for, for treating uh, cutaneous lymphomas and Cesare syndrome. 
Capillary leak is a big issue. And then anti-CCR, I'm sorry, anti-CIR 3, uh, 3D2 is another very effective agent for clearing the blood compartment. It's still in clinical trials. The one I wanted to mention was mogamolizumab or the anti-CCR4 antibody. Again, this was uh, the Maverick trial was mentioned. This also works really, you have a differential response rate in different compartments. It works well in the blood, second in the skin, and then much less in the lymph node. Um, so if somebody has blood involvement, that could be, if it's available, could be a great agent for those patients. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about, I know we've done this earlier as well, about different stages and what, how I approach this. So um, stage one, a, one to two A, which is early stage disease. Again, starting with skin-directed approaches. I think that we've heard a lot about that today and good skin care. If there's less than 10% of body surface area, I usually ask my dermatology colleagues to prescribe topical treatments, uh, ointments and things like that. Uh, I've listed a few of them here. Topical imiquimod is another one. Um, and if there's more than 10% body surface area, then we go to things like phototherapy, PUVA, or total skin electron beam, which actually could be low dose now. I mean, initially these were done with high dose radiation up to 36 gray, but now we have studied data to suggest that even up to 12 uh, gray is pretty effective and safer for patients and better tolerated. Advanced stage disease. Um, so again, as I mentioned, you can combine systemic agents with skin-directed therapies, but you want to minimize toxicity. Also remember, most agents lead to PR. It's very hard to get a CR in this disease. We've heard about time to next treatment, and I think that's going to be another very interesting uh, endpoint for choosing patients. So emphasize symptom control and quality of life, um, and don't forget the skin care if you're giving them uh, systemic therapies. Um, my first choice in systemic therapy is usually immunomodulatory agents. So I don't start with CHOP chemotherapy. I don't start, I've had patients come to me who've had CHOP chemotherapy, not the best option for cutaneous lymphomas. And I know I'm preaching to, to the wrong crowd. You guys are experts, but unfortunately there's, you know, there's poor understanding of this disease. People see T-cell lymphoma and they go to aggressive therapy. Um, so immunomodulatory agents, oral bexerotin or retinoid is a great option to start with can be combined with multiple modalities. Uh, we've used a lot of interferon. Uh, it's very well tolerated. It upregulates the Th1 um, immune environment. It can be combined with other agents. And now with pegylated interferon, um, perhaps the side effect profile is better. Um, ECP, we've heard a great lecture, two great lectures on that. And then low-dose methotrexate. Um, and so it can, you know, you just monitor the liver function. Um, so these are some of my first choice agents for systemic disease. And then um, we select some targeted therapies if you, know, if you need to go further. Romadepsin, which is an HDAC inhibitor. I know it's not available in Europe, but I have found it to be a very useful medication in this disease. Um, I tend to modify the schedule a little bit. I start with weekly treatments for three, give them the two, two or three cycles of that and then make it every two weeks so that they can tolerate it better. You can give it for long periods of time. Side effect profile is very manageable, but you have to worry about immunosuppression and make sure they're on the appropriate prophylaxis. Brintuximab, Vidotin, um, you have to worry about neuropathy. And again, you need CD30 expression, though there is still, there are trials ongoing looking at varying degrees of CD30 expression, including CD30 negative to see if that will still produce responses. So the question of how much CD30 positivity is needed is a, a little bit unclear. Generally, my practice is anywhere about five to 10%. I, I at least give it, a, give it a try, especially in tumor stage disease. And then mogamolizumab is, is again very effective in blood and skin uh, compartment. Um, these are, I just wanted to mention allogeneic stem cell transplant. We've heard a lot about it, um, and I won't uh, give you too much details. These are just some of the series of transplant that are published. Um, one thing you should note is the number of patients in these series. I mean, there's a lot of patients with cutaneous lymphomas, but these series are pretty small because it's not done very often. Um, it's, there is consensus on using reduced intensity regimens, um, but if you look at outcomes, um, you know, they're not you have uh, progression-free survival that, that's you know, around 50% at best, maybe even less than that. So a lot of these patients will relapse. But again, the relapses that we see are early stage, are more manageable, and the transplants are only being done in life-threatening situations. So 
you know, aggressive disease, first relapse, um, those are the patients you would be selecting. But, uh, and then using the Proclippy data, we now can probably select patients who, who we think are going to have a poor prognosis or have, uh, uh, you know, worsening outcomes in the first few years of their disease. And we could probably choose better patients for transplant at that point. Um, Cesare syndrome, we've, again, I'm not gonna belabor this too much, I know it's getting late. You wanna pick agents that are more effective in the blood compartment. Um, ECP, we heard, is the number one choice everywhere. I've used a lot of elemtuzumab as well, the CD52 antibody. Um, if ECP is intolerable, or a second line, romidepsin, mogamalizumab, and then we mentioned brintuximab, medotin, it wasn't studied in Cesare syndrome. We don't know if it really works or doesn't work. I, I tend to avoid it if I can, um, unless they have tumor stage disease as well, and then you need to treat both. In large cell transformation, which is a special case, um, you have to think about single versus multiple areas of large cell transformation. A single lesion or a larger cell can, uh, lesion can be treated with local radiation very effectively, and you can use, continue to use your other modalities for the patch plaque disease if it's present. If it's CD30 positive and you want to do systemic therapy, you could do brintuximab, romidepsin. I do a lot of combinations of romidepsin. Romidepsin pembrolizumab combination is actually being studied. It seems to be very effective. Uh, lenalidomide. I use a lot of pralatrexid as well. I don't know if it's available here or not. It's another um, uh, antifolate. It's approved for T cell and cutaneous T cell lymphoma. Uh, pembrolizumab, doxel, and gemcitabine. I personally don't like gemcitabine that much. I know Julia likes it much <laughs> more than I do. I just find it to be much, but it's a, a matter of what you use. And again, none of these, especially when you get to the bottom part, they're almost alphabetically listed. I haven't listed them alphabetically, but it's dealer's choice at this point. Uh, refractory disease is another problem. Um, we always recommending, re, uh, you know, we should always re-biopsy to see if there's any clonal changes, and if you can sequence it, that's very helpful. Uh, you also wanna make sure it's still the same disease and you're not dealing with something else um, or a flare of some sort. You look for clinical trials. This is where I start to get into more, you know, aggressive chemos or combination chemotherapies, uh, cyclophosphamide, atopicide. If there's systemic disease, like lung or visceral involvement, I'll go to CHOP or CHOAP at this point. And then, of course, allogenic stem cell transplant. Uh, skin care, I'm not going to go over this. I've already talked about that. So in conclusion, you have to manage this as a chronic disease. So you've got to pick your agents knowing that you're going for the long haul. Um, and again, CR is not that important. You need to try to control the disease and minimize side effects. Use a multidisciplinary approach. Don't forget supportive care. Try to use single agents as much as possible before going to combinations. Um, and then, of course, we want to incorporate biomarkers and precision medicine. We want to really understand these patients better, who should be treated with aggressive treatments early, who, should, who can be monitored. We, we're still... Uh, not 100% clear on those, and so that needs to be studied. And with this, um